Welcome to church. Welcome to Life Church Panania. Thank you for joining us. We're your hosts for the day. I'm Ian. And I'm Eleanor. And today is Mother's Day. And we remember how important mums are. Where would we be without them? But let's pray before we do anything else. Father, thank you for being our parent, the parent that we need, the parent who gives us life. But we also today especially remember mums and thank you for the life that they have given to us. They were only human. They did the best they could within their own circumstances. And we want to say, help us to cherish the fondest memories of our mothers and to bless you for the way that you've worked in human beings so that we might have the very best of life. And we want to respond now with our Mother's Day service so that we would indeed praise your name and give you the glory, for we ask it in your Son. Amen. Here's our first song for today. Everything that has breath, what does it do? Praise the Lord. Let's sing together. Praise the Lord. Everything that has breath can indeed praise the Lord. When things are tough, where do you go? I go to the rock.
course, is Jesus. Now, what's our news? What's what's coming up? Today is Mother's Day. Of course, you remember that. And for our physical service, we have little gifts. If you would like to join us for our physical service, you're most welcome. Tomorrow night, our church council is meeting for its regular monthly meeting. So please remember to pray for the leaders. And then on Wednesday morning, we will have a Go Deeper Bible study, and it will use the question sheet that you've uh, got in front of you or that you can print out uh, associated with this video. You can come, the study starts at 11, goes to 12.30, but you can come earlier and stay later if you'd like to participate in that. And we'd also like to say thank you to those of you who are generous supporters of this ministry in Panania and to our overseas partners as well. Thank you for sharing. So let's now come and bring our prayer request to the Lord. Father, again, we thank you for mothers. And again, we ask that you would help us to cherish the fondest memories of those who gave us life and who started us on this life's journey. But we also thank you for the other people that you've placed around us. And today we, we think of our spiritual mothers and spiritual nurturers, the spiritual fathers who have carried us to a new level of spiritual life. Thank you for those who laid down a prayer legacy over which we travel still today. And again, we pray for our world. What a sad, broken world it is. Remember Ukraine and ask that you would use even these terrible circumstances of war to be opportunities for the gospel to go out. So in the midst of bad news, we ask that good news would flourish. And we pray for one another. Thank you for those who are part of our church family and for those who are those who pray for us, who pray with us, who care about us and who lift us up. Father, thank you for these lovely people. May we also be part of your solution to them so that we become those who are the ones who pray. We become the ones who give generously. We are the ones who are able to share our insights and to be part of your solution. So for all that we have and all that we do, Father, what can we do but lift up our hearts and say, thank you, Jesus, for all you've done. And we do that in his name. Amen. Jesus said, no one can serve two masters. And here's a song that is built around that text. Let's listen to our band sing this for us. Success today is most commonly measured in terms of bank accounts, material possessions, who you know and position in the corporation. But the truly successful person is the one to whom God will say, well done, good and faithful servant. You don't need a big Ferrari or a house with a swimming pool. Spend your days in praise of the Lord. Don't be the devil's fool. The Lord has the power, He knows the secret, yes, yes, of success, success and happiness. Some people know the secret, the secret of success, but it's not really a secret, it's open to all the rest. 
doesn't necessarily mean money. It's your life, your life you must invest. Just give to the Lord all you can afford. Try to help others too. But don't worry about money, cause money don't worry about you. Jesus too. Put God first, yes, all of the time in everything you do. Have faith, have faith in the Lord and you'll see. He'll help you find success, success and humbleness. Just give to the Lord all you can afford. Try to help others too But don't worry about money Cause money don't worry about you Jesus once said The lilies don't fret So never worry The best is yet to come Good news You're one of the chosen few it's true. But here's a song that you know very well, and I hope that you'll be able to sing along with it, and it becomes your testimony. I've decided to follow Jesus. Now we turn to God's Word and we open it up to our, our text from 2 Peter chapter 2. Hear the word of the Lord. They are like unreasoning animals, born as of nature for capture and destruction. In that they are ignorantly blaspheming. They are included in the destruction of those who will be destroyed. Behaving unrighteously is the wages of unrighteousness. They hedonistically promote open displays of self-indulgence. They are defects and blemishes, reveling in their deceptions as they feast with you. Committing adultery with their eyes, never ceasing from sin, enticing unstable souls, having a heart trained in greed, they are offspring of the curse. They have abandoned the straight way, having wandered off to follow the way of Balaam of Beor, who loved the wage of unrighteousness. But he was rebuked for his transgression by a donkey unable to speak that spoke in human voice and restrained the prophet's foolishness. 
These, these are springs without water and fogs driven by storm. Blackest darkness is reserved for them. Speaking arrogant, empty words, they appeal to the sensual passions of the flesh and entice back those who take few steps to escape from living in error. They promise freedom while they themselves are slaves to corruption. Everyone is a slave to whatever has mastered them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And what a text for our times. Do you ever feel that your life is out of control? Do you ever feel like someone else is pulling your strings? Well, the good news is God wants for you to have more control over your own life, over your own circumstances, even over your own feelings. And here is how it works. First thing is you need to take control of your own mind. It starts inside. And we're going to explore that now. Here are two people. One of them is a Christian. One of them is a non-Christian. They both have the same brain capacity, same learning ability, the same earning potential, same emotional intelligence, lovely people. Uh, they make the same health choices. They have the same life expectancy. Christians, to a large extent, look exactly like everyone else. But there's a couple of important differences. Christians have a different viewpoint, a different worldview. They see the world differently. And of course, we're going ultimately to a very different destination. You know, what about this viewpoint? The Christian viewpoint looks like this. Time is linear. There's a timeline. It's limited. It has a start point and end point. And outside that is only eternity. Jesus is the one who created the timeline in the first place. He stepped into it and his death and his resurrection proves to us that outside this timeline, there is eternity. There is something more than we experience on the timeline. Back at the beginning, it was he who created everything and everything was good. But it was people who in their failure to respect God, obey God, heed God, we were the causes of things going wrong. But God stepped in again, and he is the one who initiates the solution through Jesus. How do we access that? Repentance is absolutely essential. We've got to let go of what's holding us down, and then, having repented, step into a new lifestyle. That is the Christian viewpoint of the world. Now, how do we access that in a way that is helpful? Contrast this to the unreasoning. The non-Christian viewpoint does not have the same solid logic that the Christian viewpoint has. So when we're taking control of our mind, we need to ask ourselves the why question. Why do I do the things that I do? What drives me to make the choices that I make? Well, my past, things that have happened in to me long ago, short while ago, they control my personality from within. This drives me. And my perceptions of the world around me, they also determine why I do the things that I do. But it's only half the story. I do the things that I do because there are things I want to avoid and there are things that I want to achieve. So on top of that, we then need to ask ourselves the what question so we don't go around in ignorance. So what am I doing? This is the practical aspect of my choice. So what is it that makes me do the, the what, what I'm going to do? The how am I going to achieve that? It comes because of my needs, my wants, and the outcomes that I want to achieve. And I can do that in either of two ways. I can do it wisely, or I can do it ignorantly. Now, in reality, those, those two overlap because we can't have perfect knowledge. But 
we can overcome our ignorance with wisdom. This is God's practical application of what we do know. And so scripture says, if any of you lacks wisdom. Now notice that it's lacking wisdom. It doesn't say if any of you lacks knowledge. You can get your knowledge somewhere else. But if you lack wisdom, simply ask God. And he who generously gives to all will do so without criticizing. And it will be given to you. So you can know why and what and choose well. Take control of your mind. On top of that, take control of your relationships. We are all in relationships. Some of them are more fun than others. Some of them are more necessary than others. And what we need to do is set relational boundaries. There can be no self-indulgence on our part where we push others, nor can we allow others to practice self-indulgence against us and push against our boundaries? Boundaries are good, helpful, beneficial, and they, they keep people in their proper relationships. Crossing a boundary is a trespass. Uh, in this case, it might be a, a financial prosecution, but there's an emotional price to pay if we allow trespassers to violate boundaries. Do you remember this from last week? Disciples practice discipline or they are disciplined. <laughs> Which one do you want? The, the verse says, if we self-discipline with integrity, we will not come under discipline. But when we are disciplined by the Lord, we are being discipled. So you decide who is going to discipline you. Option A is you practice self-discipline, and option B is that God has to impose discipline on you. But it's your choice. This self-discipline or this self-control is not a standalone quality. Notice how it's integrated with lots of other virtues that all together build towards maturity. So what do you do? Make every effort to add. And what are the things you add? You add to your faith virtue and knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness, love. Because if you possess these qualities and if you continue to grow in them, they will keep you from being ineffective or unproductive. In your knowledge as the Lord Jesus Christ. You know him. Now, have a relationship with him. And that relationship will help build your other relationships with other people. The spirit that God gave us, the Holy Spirit, obviously, does not make us timid. So if you're feeling fearful, if you're feeling timid, that's not God at work in your life. That's you listening to someone else or something else. The Holy Spirit does not make us timid. Instead, the Holy Spirit gives us power, love, and self-discipline. This gives us a way forward. And then we need to set not just relational boundaries, but personal limits we can't just keep on going on and on and on and never ceasing because it'll end up taking us the wrong way. There's a, a better alternative. Now, here's a verse that's not used in this context, but we're going to put it here anyway because it is helpful. The only tests that you have are tests that all people have. Now, let's just pause for a sec at that point and note that the particular test you have is unique to you. No one else is in your circumstances or within your frame of reference or relates to people the way that you do. Your test is unique, but the sort of test that you're having is exactly the same sorts of tests that everyone else has. And it's the same sort of test you have in different circumstances. So what do you do with all of these different tests that all of us are having? You trust God. Why? Because he will not let you be tested more 
then you can stand. So if you think, I can't stand this, then you need to say, where is God in this? And this is where he is. When you are tested, God will give you a way out of that test. Now, you won't necessarily take you out of that circumstance or out of that relationship, but he will help you out of the test. And so if you think you can't stand it, stop looking at the test and start looking to God and where he's pointing you as the way forward. Then you will be able to endure it. Don't be immature. Flee the passions of immaturity and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace. These are the doorways that take you out of your test. When you talk to God about this, here's a suggestion for you. The Lord and Moses would meet face to face as a man speaks to his friend. Now, Moses never saw the Lord face to face. So how do we apply this? It would be like you and I talking to one another. But if I'm not there, and here's what you can do. When you talk to the Lord, set out two chairs, one for you, one for him. You sit on yours and talk to him as if you are talking to him face to face because he is there. He is there with you and you can speak with him the way that you would speak to a friend. And if you listen, you'll find that he's speaking to you, friend to friend. But don't be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. There's a better alternative to that. As we move on, we, we not only take control of our mind and our relationship, but it's time to take control of your stuff and Let's face it, you've got plenty of stuff. We can learn out of our text today that money is to be honestly earned. Here's this Old Testament character. You know, we won't take the time to do the whole backstory, but just he's, he's an example, an Old Testament character who loved the wage of unrighteousness. It was not being honestly fairly earned. So what we find is a New Testament alternative to this. Paul says, when we were with you, we would give you this command. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. I wonder if anyone would be game in, in their own family, in our state or nation, to apply, if anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. How would that change things? Now, now, notice the wording. It does not say if anyone is not able to work. But quite differently, it says if anyone is not willing to work. If anyone doesn't want to work, then there's a consequence. There are always consequences. And the problem with this Old Testament character is he loved the money. He loved the wage. And the New Testament warns us it's the love of money that's the root of all kinds of evil. And again, read what it says. It doesn't say money is the root of all kinds of evil. It says the love of money. It's when money controls us and all sorts of problems will follow as a result. Question. Do you hold your possessions or do your possessions have hold of you? Money is also to be wisely invested in contrast to this Old Testament character and his foolishness with the way he pursued money. Money needs to be wisely invested. And we have lots of... Uh, verses and encouragements in scripture is one of them dishonest money dwindles away but the one who gathers money little by little makes it grow 
You see, there is no such thing as a get-rich-quick scheme. There is only get-rich-quick scams. But the one who gathers money little by little makes it grow. Jesus told a, a parable. And towards the end of the parable, uh, the master had given someone five talents. A talent is a, an amount of money. And the uh, fellow came back uh, and said, See, I have gained five more talents. And his master's response was, Well done, good and faithful slave. You are faithful in a few things. I'll put you in charge of many. Enter into the joy of your master. And likewise, another slave came back and he reported two talents. And he got exactly the same response. Well done, good and faithful slave. Enter into the joy of your master. By contrast, there was another person, another slave, who gave back to the master the money he'd been entrusted with in the first place. And the master's response, you ought to put my money in the bank so that when I came back, I would at least have received my money back with interest. Our, our money and our, our resources, our, our physical stuff needs to be wisely invested. You've probably heard of the OECD somewhere on the news, on the telly. Uh, they pop up all the time. Do you, know, do you have any idea what OECD stands for? It's the Organisation for Economic Cooperation and Development. Originally started with US, Canada and Western Europe, but the, the lighter coloured countries there are others that have been added into um, the group. Uh, so currently there are 38 members. And the interesting thing is those 38 countries are responsible for 80% of all the world's trade. Now th this crowd did a survey and it was uh, about um, money and finance. They called it a better life index. Uh, and they surveyed people both within the OECD countries and outside. And there are a couple of questions. One of them had this answer. They asked people, are you satisfied with your personal income? And the countries that had the lowest satisfaction with their personal income were the Slovak Republic, Estonia, Brazil and Mexico. There was also a second question. That question was about satisfaction with your income. The second question was satisfaction with your quality of life. And an interesting thing happened. Of those bottom countries, some of them had the highest life satisfaction and some of them had the lowest life satisfaction. So what you learn out of this is while money determines your standard of living, it has no bearing on the quality of life that we live. And it applies not only in the Slovak Republic or Mexico, it applies here. Our standard of living is set by our financial reserves but not our quality of life. The standard of living is connected to your bank balance, but your quality of life is connected to your heart attitude. And so that's why Jesus comes and he says, I have come so that they may have life and have it abundantly. He ramps it up to another level altogether. And it's not about giving us more stuff. He doesn't come to give us a higher standard of living. He comes to give us a quality of life. And it doesn't depend on being rich. One more thing. Only keep as many possessions as you can keep under control. You probably need to do a bit of a cull sometime soon. There's one more thing. Let's take control of our words. <laughs> These people that we're bumping up against that are um, 
not very helpful, are like springs without water. Lots of promise, but no delivery. Uh, so what we need to do as we look at them and learn the opposite is we need to speak words that build up as opposed to those who speak arrogant, empty words. And look at this building up. How does it happen? Let no unwholesome word proceed out of your mouth. If you can't say something nice, keep your big mouth shut. So only speak such words as is good for building up according to the need of the moment. It's no formula. And what's the purpose? So that it will give grace to those who hear. You can always give more grace, more grace. And we can add to that the whole body, the church, joined and held together with by every joint with which it equipped. When each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up. That's what we're here for. We're here for one another, to build up one another. We build up ourselves individually, and with that, it gives us the resource to be able to build up one another. And then we need to speak words that fill up. The, the promise it needs to have a delivery. If I speak with the tongues of men and angels, but do not have love, I am only a ringing gong or a clanging cymbal. So Jesus summarized it beautifully when he said, let your yes be yes. Let your no be no. So let's be clear concise and truthful don't be a mere puppet to other people or other circumstances scripture shows how you can helpfully take control of all aspects of your life here's now our song of response we can be salt and light so let's lift up our voices and sing salt and light
thank you for sharing with us in our service today. It's been a pleasure to be with you as you go out and you be salt and light. Heavenly Father, thank you for the blessings you've poured into these people. And as they go forth, give them control over their, themselves, control of their mind, their relationships, their possessions and their words, that they might be an accurate reflection of your grace and your truth through Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for being with us. Please like us, share what you've um, experienced. Tell someone about your online church experience. And we trust that you will go out and fulfill this purpose to make followers of Jesus by being followers of Jesus. Thank you. Let's now have a nice cup of tea while we have a look at these and answer the Go Deeper questions. God bless you.